Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for listening to us. We are Canter Investment Group. Uh, we're going to be examining a wine data set today to help you make one less poor decision at a time with machine learning. Next slide, please. Our agenda is we'll go over our team strategy and goals, uh, an overview of the wine data set, uh, talking about our data cleansing and exploration, our data preparation, then we'll go into our machine learning models. First, we'll start with unsupervised with k-means and silhouette models, and then supervised with linear regression, deep neural networks, and random forest. Then we'll compare our models and make any recommendations. Uh, so today presenting is myself, Jamie, Margaret and Vivian. Uh, so at first we were hoping to do a gaming data set. Um, I used to work in gaming uh, and we thought it'd be super interesting. But the data set we found ended up just having so many missing values and other problems when we started trying to run machine learning models. So we uh, had to rethink our strategy. Vivian found a wine data set that's quite famous. Uh, so we decided to work on that. Our aim is really to gain a better understanding of the wine data set and uh, explore its features and test our machine learning knowledge then uh, with the aim of being able to help wine producers and tasters to better understand their wines. Wine used to be considered quite a luxury item, but more and more it's becoming a mainstream drink. Uh, there are definitely very high barriers to entry, but more wine companies spring up every year um, and more wines are put onto the market. Uh, the difficulty with grading wine is it's based upon probably our most un understood or least understood uh, sense, which is taste. And this is very subjective. So we're hoping to be able to create models to help give wine graders and tasters a virtual a set of virtual taste buds to be able to give them a baseline grading of the wine is to be able to improve the quality of the scores that they're able to give. Uh, so the data set comes from uh, wines in the Portuguese Vino Verde region. Uh, it has a total of 6,497 observations and 13 features, which are all listed out here on the right hand side. Uh, most of the input features are right skewed um, and they range greatly in value, so scaling will be needed. First thing we did was do a confusion matrix, a correlation matrix, excuse me. Uh, the correlation matrix can be read as uh, the darker the red, the stronger the positive relationship, and the darker the blue, the stronger the negative relationship. So looking at the quality line, we can see that alcohol is quite strongly correlated with quality, and density is very negatively uh, correlated with uh, quality. As I said before, that alcohol was strongly related. We wanted to explore that a little more, looking at the alcohol percentage against quality. What we notice here is that actually uh, zero is red wine and there's no red wine in our data set with a quality rating of nine or above. But what's clear is that both the red and the wine data set show us our similar pattern in that the stronger the wine, the higher the quality rating. Here we are seeing that the highest quantity in wines of any of the uh, physiochemical properties is total sulfur dioxide. Uh, sulfur dioxide is used as a preservative in the wine to extend its shelf life. We all know that older wines are considered better wines. Uh, but the thing that we really noted was the, the range of values is very great. So that we're definitely gonna have to do some transformation uh, with some standard digestion. 
I'm going to pass you on to Vivian, who will now uh, speak about data cleansing. Okay, thank you, Jamie. So after the data exploration, we decided to go with the cleansing part before we do any further model for the data set. Uh, the first thing that we found was that the data had around 38 missing values. We decided to delete these missing values, most of it because it is just a few compared to the total observations of 6,497. Um, also, we um, decided to drop, instead of using the medians or the or what's so-called the averages method, since we did not have enough expertise to validate a change. Um, we also found out that we have around 1,168 duplicates in this data set, but we decided we're going to remain the data set the same thing, not dropping the duplicated values, because on, with the understanding of the nature of this data set, there are some situations where wines have the same features that um, with, with the same features with the nature, it is like the fixed acidity, pH, um, citric acid, but then they belong to different brains or uh, different years, different bottles or some other factors of the, of the wine as well, not just these. So we didn't remove the duplicates. Uh, next, we prepared our data before we do any further model. The first thing that we need to do was that uh, Jamie was also talking about the variation in the value of each feature in the data set, so which is why we did the scaling first. We do the standardization scaling for the features so that they perform as they um, perform in uh, in a standard standard distribution as a standard distribution with with a general variation. And next, we do the principal components analysis. The purpose was that we could find like the optimal features count for the data set while minimizing information loss, which means that. Um, we can find like how many of the features, uh, what's the percentage of the features that can actually explain most of the uh, most of the um, indications from the data set or from the model that we can do for this with this data set. And what we found was that to be able to obtain at least ninety five percent of the variance explained, we need at least nine principal components to account for the variance. So nine features. Um, the next thing that we do was to, we transform the output data. The original output was the, you know, the quality feature. It contains the value from one to 10, but then we found out that the data, that the feature, the output feature actually have a imbalanced nature that it usually, um, that we usually move uh, from, from, the imbalanced nature that it just in between uh, six, a uh, four to eight, which can affect the, the result of the um, algorithms in machine learning. So we decided to break these output into three sections, like three classes only, which is okay, stands one stands for okay, two stands for great, and three stands for excellent. And as you can see that in number one, in the one, in the first class, it obtains the output value at around 1 to 45, and then the grade class for 4.5 to 6.5, and the last one is more than 6.5, uh, less than 10. Uh, after that, we do the, 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 the trend and the test split for the data set, which is very necessary for any algorithm later on. Uh, we decided that we choose the 20% as the percentage of the test data to make sure that the, the algorithm can learn the most from, from the trend data set to predict. Next, can I have the next slide, please? So the first uh, machine learning models that we decided to do was that we decided to treat this data set as a, a supervised learning uh, problem. And we use k-mean to understand the, um, to, to classify these, these data set. We use the elbow method to decide what is the optimal K for the K-mean model. Um, and we found that around three or four are the, the, el the, el um, the elbow phones between three, K of three or four um, is the optimal number of groups. But this is, might be too subjective, just basing on the elbow, elbow method. So we try to use other metrics as well. 
we use the uh, silhouette score to divide which is the best result um, and to see whether K is equal to two or three is also the best choice. We, in all of the case of two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine that we tested for the silhouette score, we found that around two, three, four, five would be one of the best, uh, one of the best um, K that would give the least, the least fall from the average of the silhouette. And then we chose to give some model score like the homogeneity and a complete score for K two, three, four, five. And we found that with K equal, equal to four, we're gonna have the best model score, homogeneity score, completeness score, and the silhouette score as well. So that could be our, um, our, our best clusters. The next um, machine learning algorithm that was used was the logistic regression. We decided to treat this as the basic, uh, the baseline model for our uh, supervised learning met method. And um, we, we, the, um, our, our output has been transformed into three classes. So this could be a multi-class parameter, a multi-class logistic regression. The results indicate that we have seven, around 78% for the accuracy for the trend, the trend set and around 79 or 80% for the test set. We can see that this is not a pretty much a strong result for because the motor can only learn about 70% from the transat, and 70% of the time it predicts the right result. So uh, we decided to move on to some advanced motor, but of course that we found uh, some, of the, um, uh, some of the good metrics that we also found for this baseline motor is that 65% of the time, the um, positive prediction is predicted correctly. Um, uh, this also turns out a model that predicts around 41% of a wine score of a certain quality grade that was actually scored that way. The next machine learning model, I'm gonna pass it to uh, Margaret. Jamie. I'm gonna pass it to Jamie, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Vivian. Uh, so the next model that we used was deep neural networks. We ran six iterations of this uh, deep neural network to see if we could get our best fitting. Uh, our first uh, iteration used three hidden layers with no regularization. Uh, as you can see from the graph on the right, it looks like there's been some overfitting where the model training accuracy hits 99%, but the testing accuracy is only 84%. Next slide, please. Uh, so our next model, we added in regularization of 0.01. This dramatically reduced the scores for training and testing and increased the sort of variance in between the epochs. Uh, so we thought this has overdone the fixing of the overfitting. So we reduced the regulariz regularization to 0 0.001. This improved the uh, model quite a lot and we're quite happy with that, but we wanted to continue testing so we moved on to the next slide please we decided to add a hidden layer to see if this improved the testing score this didn't have that much of an impact on our uh, accuracy or testing accuracy uh, with the fifth iteration we reduced the hidden layers to two this again reduced the accuracy for both the training and testing data set so we decided to not go forward with that. Our sixth iteration uh, again two hidden layers but this didn't work and our seventh iteration we dramatically increased the number of neurons. This did slightly improve the accuracies that we found but the model took so long to run that it's not pragmatic to continue with that. Uh, so overall if we go to the next slide, overall we thought the third model with the 
uh, four hidden layers and uh, three hidden layers and 0 0.001 was the best model with the highest validation accuracy. Uh, the reason we didn't select model one was because uh, we felt that it was overfitting. So thank you. I'm going to pass you on to Margaret now, who's going to talk about Random Forest. Thanks, Jamie. Um, OK, so our next model that we ran was the Random Forest classifiers. Um, That's not the right sign. Okay, so the next model that we did was the random forest classifiers where we first um, set up the parameters for a thousand N estimators and played around with the max depth of the trees at 1, 5, 12, 13, and 15. Um, we found that at 12, it was the most optimal max depth value. And that turned out for us an accuracy of 95% for a train and 84% for our test. Um, but we felt that we still needed to test other scenarios. Um, we also wanted to see the k-fold cross validation to make sure that our model performance was um, averaging the way it was presenting uh, we found that the mean of it was at 83 uh, percent with a standard deviation of plus minus 1.3 so our model's accuracy fluctuation was not that bad um, one of the other things that you could do with a random forest is see the importance score of each of its features. So um, we wanted to look at the features that we should be focusing on or, and the ones that we could possibly drop. Uh, we saw that with alcohol percentage, density, and the volatile acidity of um, the wines. Those were our strongest performers. And then uh, for the weak features, we saw that citric acid fixed acidity and type were underperforming. So we had a few iterations where we dropped the wine type. And then again with wine type, citric acid and fixed acidity. And we saw that both iterations still had a decent um, accuracy performance as the model that we did originally. So we decided to look in further and hyper tune our um, our parameters. So for this first version, we used our original number of estimators at a thousand um, and then wanted to look at the number of uh, leaf samples and the sample split and also the criterion to be using um, and played around with that. This took a lot of computing power, so it was um, it took a lot of time for us to get the results, but it turned out a 100% accuracy rate for a train and 86% for a test, which is 2% better than our original. Um, so we wanted to move further and see if we could keep pushing it um, without the possibility of overfitting, uh, which happens when you do hyperparameter tuning. So for this next version, we wanted to see if an increase in estimators um, would affect our, our results. So we plugged in our parameter grid, um, 1,500, 2,000, and 2,500 estimators. Um, this gave us uh, the highest number of N estimators to be the most optimal. Um, with our accuracy rate still at 100% and the test at 86%. Uh, and uh, with a k-fold cross-validation, we found that the test accuracy um, average is at 84%, deviating by around 1% again. Um, so we were kind of iffy about this model because hyperparameter tuning can result to overfitting. We felt more comfortable pushing forward with our original um, random forest. 
so comparing all the models that we uh, churned out, we think that the winning model would be our first random forest model with a 95% accuracy rate and 85% testing accuracy for um, the results. So here are our recommendations. So first is for the winemakers. We suggest for them to con consider playing around with the alcohol percentage, volatile acidity, and the residual sugar content of the wines that they have or the ones that they, are, uh, that they are going to be making. Also looking at the factors that impact these features as well. Um, another thing for the sellers is that these results could be used to be able to pinpoint or create consumer profiles so that they can match the wine quality scores to the people that, they, that are buying them from, um, from their retail stores. Um, which is great for their marketing and targeting and could possibly result into more revenue. Um, one of the other things that we also wanted to do is to be able to get more data. Um, wines from different brands can have the same quality score. So being able to have that, such as uh, the brand of the wine, the year, the soil composition, climate, um, even the price would um, be able to help us out greatly and give us more context for the results. Um, another thing also is with more data, we could provide companies or users uh, a digital service that would analyze all these different um, wine brands and quality scores and match them with wines that um, resonate more with their preference and price points without sacrificing the quality scores. Um, lastly, one uh, lastly or last suggestion would be would be going out and discovering more wines. Uh, wine quality scores are subjective to the sommeliers tasting them, so uh, users shouldn't be afraid to try new bottles. Um, also, wine ratings are not always available, so we think that you should all be brave and just try any wine out. <laughs> So that's it for our presentation. Uh, we're open to Q&As, but because we are recording on a Zoom, um, please leave your comments. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.